Good evening, good afternoon, and good morning. We have a global audience with us today, and I welcome you all wherever you might be. My name is Michael Javry Pickett, and I am the newsroom editor-in-chief at the Cutter Foundation. It is my pleasure to welcome you to the latest online edition of Cutter Foundation's Education City Speaker Series, which is a platform that provides people with an opportunity to learn, hear from, and interact with thought leaders on the key topics facing our world. Today's event is presented in partnership with the World Innovation Summit for Health, also known as WISH, and you can watch the discussion unfold and be part of it, either on the WISH Summit's platform or on WISH's Facebook and YouTube channels. Today we are attending a masterclass, and our teacher is Giles Dooley, an award-winning war photographer, storyteller, humanitarian, and, should you care to follow him on one of his other Instagram accounts, Chef. You can find that account at The One-Armed Chef. Imagine living one life, and then right around the time you think you have it all figured out, how you fit into the world, what you do well, how best to interact with others, that life ends and a new one begins. How would you respond? Or imagine being on one side of a story, and then you find yourself on the completely opposite side. How would you react? In early February 2011, Giles Dooley was able-bodied. Then, a few days later, he wasn't. The title of today's masterclass is Reframing Our View of Disability. As a photojournalist, Giles had to reframe his life and his career after his accident. For almost 10 years now, he has lived the other side of the story. He knows 100% what it means to live as an able-bodied man, and now he knows what it is like to live with disabilities, perhaps most tellingly, what it is like to be seen as someone who has disabilities. Today, Giles will share with us how he reframed his view of disability and how we can all hopefully learn from his experience. The founder and CEO of the NGO Legacy of War Foundation, Giles is a campaigner for the rights of refugees and those living with disabilities caused by conflict. He is documenting the long-term impact of conflict globally through his photographic project, Legacy of War. In 2011, while working in Afghanistan, Giles was severely injured by an IED, and as a result of his injuries, is a triple amputee. During this masterclass, he will speak about how disabled people are viewed in society and how, despite recent changes, there are aspects where the status quo has not changed when it comes to including this community in decision-making processes. Before we begin, I must mention a few housekeeping items. The format for today's masterclass is as follows. Giles will speak for about 20 minutes before our 25 minute Q&A from the audience. Please use the Q&A section of this webinar to post questions and we'll try to get to as many as possible. If you want to post about this discussion on your social media channels, it would be great if you could use the hashtags EC Speaker Series, Virtual Wish 2020 and One World, Our Health. I now turn the floor to Giles Dooley. Hello, um, it's great to uh, join you today. Uh, I know people from all parts of the world are here um, and it's a real honor to speak and present uh, this talk. Um, today, I want to start by telling my own story, how I came from being an able-bodied photographer into covering conflicts. Um, my journey begins um, when I was 18 years old. I had gone to America on a sports scholarship. Um, I was there um, doing boxing. I was probably the world's worst boxer. I thought I was fantastic, um, but sport was my life. And unfortunately I was involved in a minor car accident. I was flown back to England and I was told I would never do sport again. I was an 18 year old boy, very angry with the world, with my family, with the doctors, and really had no idea what I was gonna do next with my life. Everything seemed to be crashing down around me. And in that lowest moment, at that lowest ebb, two small gifts were to change my life forever. One was an Olympus OM-10 camera, and the other was a book by the war photographer, Don McCullen. My godfather had unfortunately passed away when I was in hospital, and these were the two gifts that he bestowed to me. Now, I had grown up in a house, my parents weren't interested in art or the news, and I had never seen photographs like Don McCullen's, these incredibly stark black and white images of conflicts around the world. 
And when I first saw these photographs, I was so moved. To this day, if I shut my eyes, I can still recall those first images that I saw. I knew there and then that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to follow in the footsteps of Don McCullen and become a conflict photographer. So I actually taught myself um, photography, lying in a hospital bed. I would photograph the doctors, the nurses, uh, anything around me. And I left hospital full of really good intentions to follow in footsteps of Don McCullen. But I was 19 years old and at that age, it's very easy to get distracted. Um, I had a few friends that were musicians that were in bands and they asked me to come along and photograph them. And before I knew it, magazines were ringing me um, to photograph musicians and actors and then the fashion world. And really by accident, I found that I had become a rock and roll photographer. Now, as you can imagine, at that point in my life, it was a very exciting thing to do. I traveled around the world, hanging out with these amazing musicians, stars of, of the screen, um, all sorts of interesting people. And it was an amazing life. But as time went on, I found myself increasingly unhappy. I worked as a music and fashion photographer for 10 years. But by the end, I was finding something really missing inside. In fact, I would do some of these shoots and get paid ridiculous amounts of money and then sit in my hotel room in tears. And I couldn't really understand what was missing from my life. I also didn't like the celebrity culture and I didn't like the way that women were being portrayed in a lot of the magazines that I worked for. Finally, it all came to a big climax when I was doing a photo shoot and there was a young actress in tears. It was all to do with her state of undress and what she was wearing. And I remember sitting there thinking, this is not why I became a photographer. So the rock and roll story is that I took all my cameras and I threw them out the hotel room of the Charlotte Street Hotel in Soho in London. Well, that's kind of the truth. Anybody who knows me knows I'm not quite that rock and roll. Actually, what happened is I had a little hissy fit and threw them on the bed. It was just unfortunate my cameras bounced off the bed and out the window, and they smashed in the street below. That did seem like that was gonna be the end of my photographic career. Um, I didn't know what I was gonna do next. I moved away from London. Um, I got a job in a bar in Hastings and sunk into a very deep depression. I was only 28 years old, but I'd really lost all focus on where my life was going next. And then in that lowest moment, when I really could see no future for myself, I remembered those two small gifts I'd been given 10 years before and how they had made me feel, that Olympus OM-10 camera and the book by the war photographer, Don McCullen. And I realized that's where I had gone wrong. I hadn't followed my true path. So I actually I sold my flat, um, I moved to Angola, and I began my career as a photographer documenting uh, humanitarian impact of conflict. Now, I often get called a, a war photographer, but actually I would call myself an anti-war photographer. You will never see pictures of guns and tanks. Um, you'll see pictures of soldiers. My work is to show the impact of war on civilians. I'd been in this work for about 10 years uh, when I found myself in Afghanistan. I was there doing um, a project on a group of American soldiers. And then I found myself on patrol one day. While I was on patrol, we got ambushed. And when I was ambushed, I stepped on a landmine, an IED. I immediately lost both my legs and my arm. I was lying under a tree and I remember watching the sky, thinking these would be the last moments of my life. Miraculously, there were a group of American soldiers that got me to a medivac helicopter. But I remember thinking I might just last another minute. I might just last five minutes. Then I made it to the medivac helicopter and I was flown back to Kandahar Air Base. Somehow, I survived. I was flown back to the United Kingdom. There, I spent the next 46 days in an intensive care unit. Sorry, Giles, can I just ask that you reshare your slides, please? Apparently, okay. there are some tech difficulties. Okay, my, sorry about my this. apologies. Sorry, everybody. We will just get back to this quickly. I think it's the reality of living in 2020. It's, it's something, everything comes with an asterisk 2020 this year. Yes, it does indeed. 
OK, can everybody now see the slides? Are we now? Yes, now we're good. OK, apologies to everybody. Um, as I was saying, I was injured in Afghanistan in 2011 after stepping on a landmine, an IED. Oh, sorry. Now we lost your audio. OK. Um, there we go. Yep, I haven't done yep. it. So, yep, OK, fantastic. Um, hopefully now you can both hear me and see the slides. Um, I was injured, as I say, in 2011. Uh, when I stepped on an IED, a landmine. These images were taken in the moments after that happened. I thought these would be the last moments of my life. But I remember thinking to myself, you can keep alive just for a minute. So I would focus on my breathing and try and keep going. And then I found myself on the helicopter and I would say to myself, keep going for five minutes. And through this, I managed to keep alive and I reached the military base of Kandahar in Afghanistan. Three days later, I was flown back to the United Kingdom, where I was to spend the next 46 days in intensive care. Now, many of us are dealing with lockdown at the moment. At that time in my life, I had to deal with what I would call ultimate lockdown. Sorry, my, sorry, Giles, again, uh, my apologies, slides have gone. Okay, it's actually a, supposed to be a blank screen at this stage. Fine. Sorry. Um, I was to spend the next uh, 46 days um, in intensive care. Um, sorry, can I just ask that, can you see me now or? Yes, we can. Yeah, okay, fine. Sorry, I don't know what's uh, happening at that end. Um, I was to spend 46 days in intensive care in what I call ultimate lockdown. If you imagine, I had one remaining hand and this was in a cast, so I couldn't write. I had tubes in my throat so I couldn't speak. I was actually strapped to my bed to stop me moving. In the intensive care unit, the lights never went off. There was constant sound. The only way I could communicate with the world was by blinking. If you imagine that, lying on your bed, staring at the ceiling, not seeing anything, nothing changing. The only world I had was actually inside my head. At first, I was in a panic. It was like being thrown in freezing cold water. I couldn't think straight. But I realized quite quickly that if I was going to stay sane, I would have to create a world in my own mind. Now, as I said, the lights never go off in intensive care. There's no windows. The only thing I could tell the time by was when the nurses came regularly to take my blood samples and blood pressure, etc. And so I decided that was going to be a unit of my time. And I created a world. One project was called 100 Portraits Before I Die, where I imagined doing photo shoots. I would imagine the person turning up, which camera I used, how I lit it. I would even see the results of those images in my mind. And for 46 days, that's what I did. I created this world in my mind. At the end of 46 days, I was moved into a high dependency unit. And in many ways, things got even harder then because that's when I had to come to terms with my new reality. As I said, I'd lost both my legs and my arm. When I was moved to the high dependency unit and well enough to start speaking again, I was told I would never walk again, that I would never work again, and probably never even live independently. I remember three months after my injury being taken to have a shower for the first time, I was moved to a wheelchair and taken in to have a shower. It was the first time I'd seen myself in a mirror. And I was repulsed. I was disgusted by what I saw. I was missing the limbs, scars across my body. I had a colostomy bag. When they put me back in my bed, I cried myself to sleep. And I remember thinking, I wished I just died in Afghanistan. I was not strong enough to deal with this new reality. I could not deal with the idea of spending the rest of my life living with a disability. I did not want to be that person. But the next morning, something had changed. Something had clicked in my mind. And I woke up the next day feeling much more focused and far stronger. And I decided actually that this was going to be a turning point for positive things in my life. I decided from this moment on, I would never think about the things I couldn't do, but I would focus on what I could and excel at those things. And the first thing I needed to cope with was how I saw myself. Now, I'd spent many years photographing people living with a disability, and now the time was to turn the camera on myself. I decided I wanted to do a self-portrait. I had just been in the British Museum before I went to Afghanistan. And there you will find many Roman and Greek statues, often missing parts. 
But I remember thinking, I only saw the beauty in those statues. So that's how I wanted to portray myself. So I did this self-portrait. I call it my Greek statue portrait. And this was the moment I took control of my own life again. This was the moment when I said, I don't care what people think about me. It's what I think about myself. And this was the moment that I stood strong in front of the world. After doing this portrait, um, I returned back to hospital. I spent a year in hospital. I had 37 operations. Um, but at the end of that year, I was able to begin my rehabilitation. Um, and as you can see, eventually I was able to walk again. They also taught me to make these strange grimacing faces. Eventually, 18 months after my injuries, I was well enough to hold a camera and be a photographer again. And the first place I went to was Afghanistan to finish the work that I had been doing there when I got injured. But before we finish uh, my section, I just want to very briefly share the stories of a couple of people that I've photographed. Because anybody who knows me knows I rather tell stories about other people than myself. In 2014, I went to Lebanon to document some of Syria's most vulnerable refugees, the elderly, single parent families, and those living with injuries such as myself, people such as Khouloud. Khouloud had been at home in Syria when a sniper shot her in the neck. She fell paralyzed. In fact, she landed on top of one of her own children. Her family managed to get her to relative safety in Lebanon's Bekaa Valley, which is where I met her. But she was living in a homemade tent. If you imagine a tent made of bits of cardboard, plastic, even billboard posters ripped down. A tetraplegic woman living in a tent made of cardboard. Her only support came from her incredible husband, Jamal. I remember saying to Clude, what's your one hope for the future? And she said, I just want to be a mother again. On this trip, I met many, many other people, such as, as Reem, a woman who had lost her leg in Syria, um, and this was her father, Abdel. Now, if you go online and look at my photographs, you will see most of my photographs are of people looking directly at the camera. But with Abdel, I was really struggling. We were on this rooftop, and every time I went to take his photograph, he would look to the side. Increasingly frustrated, I said, why do you not look at me when I'm taking the photograph? Adele pointed to some mountains in the distance, and he said, you see those mountains? I said, yes, and he said, that is Syria. He goes, I live on this rooftop, so the first thing I see in the morning and the last thing I see at night is my homeland. I am too old. I will probably never return home. And so Abdel is the only person I photographed not looking at my camera, because in this image, he is looking at home. Um, on this trip, I also met a young girl called Aya. Um, I was a four-year-old living with spina bifida. Now, this is an image that I believe is a really important representation of what living with disability means. Too often, people living with disability are shown as victims. But I rarely find that when I am out traveling. In fact, Aya was the feistiest four-year-old I've ever met in my life. She didn't just control her family, she controlled the whole refugee camp. She would refer to her sister, who she's playing hopscotch here with, as Donkey. And she'd say, hey, Donkey, pick me up and take me here. We'd walk around the camp. Somebody would be selling water. And she'd say, hey, Donkey, give me water. Or somebody else, hey, Donkey, give me bread. She was this incredibly feisty four-year-old. So I wanted to photograph her and represent her in a way that was true to her spirit. Because that's what I find when I travel and work in places such as the refugee camps in Lebanon. I find resilience, strength, fortitude. And more often than not, humor. Now, I came back from this trip. Um, it was uh, in, 19, sorry, in 2014. And two years later, um, I had the opportunity to return to Lebanon to retrace my steps and find some of the families that I'd met and see what had happened to them. Um, people like my friend Abdel. Now, as I said, it's great when you do portraits to show people the portraits you've done before. So. I, I always take these prints with me. But let me tell you, for somebody with, with one arm and with no legs, taking these photographic prints halfway around the world is pretty difficult. So I got there and I gave Abdel his photograph and I thought he'd be very grateful. But he looked at the image, then he looked at me and he said, Giles, you made me look really old in this. Reem was still living on the rooftop with her family. Um, 
if you go on to uh, my website, Legacy of War Foundation, you can read more about these incredible stories. Um, and Aya, again, she was as feisty as ever. This is her being pushed by her brother. She was screaming, faster, donkey, faster. So I did this trip, and as I said, I managed to track down a lot of these families, but I hadn't been able to find everybody that I met. On the last day I was in Lebanon, I got a phone call. It's a phone call I will never forget. It was from Khalud's husband, Jamal. Khalud, the woman who'd been paralyzed by a sniper. She said, we hear you're back in Lebanon. We'd love to see you. And I said, of course, where are you? And the answer shook me to my core. I felt like I'd been punched in the stomach when Jamal replied, we are in the same place you last saw us. I repeated my question. I said, no, where are you now? And he said the same place. Now, when I photographed that family two years before, I believed my photographs that were published around the world would change things. I'd never met anybody in more desperate need of help than Khalud. And I thought, how could they possibly be in the same place? I hadn't even thought to look for them there. I turned up at their, their tent, this, this makeshift tent the next day. And when I walked in, I burst into tears and I said, Khalud, I failed you. I said, you trusted me with your story. I told your story and yet nothing changed. In my own mind, I was questioning, what is the point of being a photographer? But I decided, much as I had when I was injured, that the only thing I could do was focus on what I could, not what I couldn't control. So I decided the best thing for me to do was to photograph the family and do a better job of it. And that's what I did. Over the next week, I would spend all my time with them in this tiny little place where they lived. This is Jamal cooking in the kitchen, which is to the side of this room. Whenever we're there, he would whisper to me his greatest fear. His greatest fear was that Khalud did not love him as much as he loved her. Now, it's a house. If you imagine, Khalud had not left that bed for two years, and yet there's still laughter and love. The kids would do homework on the bed. Strange as it may sound, you would leave after visiting, feeling uplifted, despite the fact that Khalud had not moved from that bed in over two years. There was no windows, nothing for her to see. Now, on the last day, I had a really difficult decision to make. As I was explaining earlier, I like to take photographs back with me to show the people that I photographed. But in my bag, I had the photograph of Khalud and Jamal, and I realized that nothing had changed in those two years. And in fact, what I was looking at when I took this photograph was identical to what I saw two years before. And I thought, if I give them that photograph, won't it remind them that nothing has changed? But I said, no, you have to give them that photograph. So I reached into my bag and I took out the photograph I took two years before and I gave it to Khulud. But before I gave it to her, I said, when I took this photograph, I did not take a photograph of a refugee. I did not take a photograph of a disabled woman. When I took this photograph, I took a photograph of a couple who are so in love with each other. And this is a photograph of love. And that's when I realized I am not a war photographer. My job is to document love around the world. And too often, as somebody living with a disability, we are portrayed simply about our disability. Our injuries are the only focus of the photograph or the story. What I am reminded of when I see this picture of Khulud is that our emotions, our stories, our ability to love and be loved. These are the things that we must focus on. Thank you. Thank you, Giles. Uh, I certainly appreciate all of the comments and I love the photographs. Let me ask you a personal question. Well, for me personally, why black and white as opposed to color? Or do you do a variety of the two? You know, I'm still trying to work out color. <laughs> I find <laughs> color really, really confusing. I think black and white focuses on emotions. And, you know, that's really what I'm trying to say is that actually a photograph is not real. You know, a photograph is not actually representing exactly uh, the reality of a situation. It's about a story. 
And so by doing it in black and white, I hope that people understand that and understand that it's it's a representation of the truth. Okay, so here's a question from Neil. How do you cope with uh, such distressing images and photographs without necessarily being able to help them out? You know, that's obviously the, the challenge all the time. Um, I, I say that these stories are like little scars on my mind and each one of them uh, stays with me. I have increasingly tried to do more. I have my own charity now and a foundation uh, that tries to help these families directly because of exactly that point, because I couldn't go home and think that I was just leaving these people with nothing changing. So I've become more of an activist. In fact, I don't really think of myself as a photojournalist. I would say I'm an angry man with a camera. Um, and for me, it's so important that action is taken. So now I'm much more of an activist. The, the photograph is the beginning of the process. I make sure that right people see those photographs and something actually happens. Yeah, that's one of the things that I noticed as you're explaining the situation and you recognize and you acknowledge how close you become to them. Mm -hmm. It's definitely true. I mean, that's, I think one of the, the big knocks against journalists is that they don't necessarily care so much about the people that they are interacting with, whereas in fact you do. And it seems like you've also developed quite frankly, some lifelong uh, friendships with these people, yes? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, Khulud, uh, the story we were just talking about, um, she now lives in, in Holland. She's been relocated. And uh, a year ago, I had an exhibition in Geneva. And the exhibition was along Lake Geneva. It was uh, one of the biggest exhibitions I've had. And I invited Khulud to come and speak at the opening. And to me, that was the most moving moment, was here was somebody who we would normally see, as you say, as as a photographer and, and there's a sort of disconnect for her to open an exhibition where she was featured in it. To me, that was the greatest moment of giving somebody the opportunity to empower themselves. And now, uh, how is she, she and the family doing? So they're, they're in Holland. Um, she obviously will, will always be in a wheelchair, but we've managed to get her, um, we, we funded when she was in Lebanon, a house. She now has a vehicle that she can get out and she can control her own uh, wheelchair now. So she's doing really well. And in fact, when, when lockdown uh, came to, to London, to the United Kingdom, the first message I got was from Hulud asking me how I was doing. And that really sums her up. She is, is like an angel. Yeah, truly. I mean, and th the love that he has for her, I think it, it makes a lot of us people who are healthy walking around with so much um, to be grateful for. Uh, he seems to be grateful for just the relationships that he has, which is something I think we can all learn from. And, and that's um, what this whole idea of reframing the idea of disability, because as somebody living with disability, I know that when people photograph me or tell my story, they want to focus on my injuries. And with Khulud, you know, by focusing on her love story, that is how we, we create real relationships and real understanding of other people, not to focus on injuries, not to focus on disabilities. So you talked about when you had that moment when you were photographing yourself, uh, one less arm, two less, two fewer legs. What was it? What advice would you have for you know people out there who are dealing, struggling with disabilities? How would you suggest, or what what advice could you give them to how to find that confidence? You know, I mean, it's it's an ongoing battle. It's every day. You know, and I always try and say that to people. It's a complex thing. You can't characterize somebody in one image or in one moment. You know, in a single day, I can be in tears in the morning thinking it's overwhelming. The same day I can believe anything's possible. I can be angry, I can be sad, I can be happy, I can be all these things. And it's important that when we portray our own stories, we are truthful and honest to that part of ourselves or one part of ourselves. Um, and for me, that particular image was about how others saw me. It really wasn't about me wanting to do a photograph. It was the fact that I realized that my greatest disability is in the eyes of others. And it's when people see me and they see me missing my limbs, they make assumptions about what I can and can't do. So by creating that image, it was a moment for me to take control of my own story, my own narrative. And say, in many ways, I don't care what you think about me. It's what I think about myself. And I would say for anybody who's trying to tell their own story, anybody that's living with a disability, it's OK to have days when it feels overwhelming. Of course it does. You know, we can't always be running around every day going, this is great, everything's fantastic. It's hard work. And we live in a society that makes it harder for us. But equally, do believe that you can live a full life. And most importantly, 
Most importantly, like Hulud, like myself, we can love and be loved. So we're coming up on the, I don't know if you would call it the 10th anniversary of your accident. Um, in that time, what sort of progress have you seen as someone with disabilities uh, where the, the global community has done a better job of recognizing that they need to do more for those with disabilities? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's still a constant challenge. And as I say, the, the, the challenge is other people's perceptions of what we're capable of. And so, you know, I, I, I make this comment about love. But, you know, you wouldn't be, you'd be amazed how many times people ask me, you know, are you in a relationship? Can you be in a relationship? Can you do that? As if we're, we're kind of not able to live normal lives. The simple fact is, yes, I'm missing two legs and an arm. But inside, I'm exactly the same person I always was. And you mentioned the one arm chef. I mean, that started as a joke because I would be out at restaurants and people would start cutting up my food for me. You know, I'd be on a date and my meal would come up cut into little pieces. And at first I'd be polite and very British and not say anything. And then one day I said, you know, enough's enough. And so I created the one arm chef because if I say so myself, I'm a pretty good cook. And so when I'm making like an egg yolk ravioli, which is quite complex for people with two hands, I would do that. And the next time somebody cut my food up and brought it out, I would show them a picture of this and say, if you want me in the kitchen, I'll outcook you, but I don't want to embarrass you like you've just embarrassed me. So, uh -huh. you know, that's that's really, these, these things, I, I, you fight in your own little ways. For me, it's about fighting by showing what I can do. You know, there are not many photographers working in, in, in my world who live with injuries like myself. And yet we are often the subject of these photographs. If you look at World Press Photo, how many imagery has people living with disability as, as an image? And yet very rarely will we find the photographer is somebody living with a disability. The way I see it is we are often the subject, but we are rarely the storyteller. Yeah, so true. All right, so here's a, a, a question from a photographer. Uh, somebody is saying that, um, I feel that my photos are not helping anyone. How can I get it into uh, humanitarian photography? And what tips would you give to somebody who wants to, I guess, present their photos so that they are powerful, as powerful as possible, but also, you know, um, helpful to the international community. Yeah. Well, I mean, when I started, what I did is I offered my services to charities, to NGOs, to help work with them, to tell their stories. But increasingly, what I do now is actually work with the individuals themselves. So when somebody says to me, who do you work for? I always say, I work for the person in the photograph. And that's what I would say for anybody who's starting out on this. Think about the person you're, you're documenting. And it sounds like a very stupid thing to say, but my first question is, how can I help you? What is it that you need from these photographs? You know, it's what we do as a charity as well. We always ask the communities, how can we help you? So my simple question would be, if you don't think your photographs are good enough or you're not sure their purpose, why not ask the person in the photograph? What is it that they would like to get from this? How will it help them? What do they think that we should do with them? And actually that's the person that takes the lead for me. And it sounds so obvious, but it's rarely done. Yeah, I, I think you're absolutely right. And I think it's because people, photographers in particular, you know, the, they're, the natural is either it's art or it is somehow journalism. And you would not go to the subject and say, what is it that I could do to improve this, right? Exactly. You would go to your editor. And that's why I, I don't call myself a photojournalist. You know, I have huge admiration for my friends that work as photojournalists, and they have to be, to a certain extent, impartial. As I said, I'm, I'm going there because I'm angry. You know, I see what's happening on, on television, on the news, and I want to do something about it. And when I meet somebody that's injured, somebody like Holud, you know, my direct question is, how can I help you? And one thing I should say, uh, again, in brief answer to that last question, we actually use those photographs and Holud's story to do a crowdfunding campaign with an amazing organization called Random Acts in America. And we raised, by sharing that story of love, quarter of a million dollars in the space of two weeks. And that was people just donating five, twenty dollars small amounts. But by people coming together, inspired by that story, we were able to rehouse many, many families uh, living in Lebanon. And that's the power of an image. So as a photographer, maybe the most important thing is not being on the cover of the New York Times. Maybe the most important thing is seeing the impact those pictures have. And for me, the most successful photograph I've ever taken is the one of Kalud that appeared on a crowdfunding campaign. That was all I could ever ask for. Yeah, I think sometimes we all want that Pulitzer, if you're American, you want that Pulitzer Prize photograph as opposed to, you know, what good could you do? Yeah. Um, another question. So 
uh, in your professional career, is there or is there a series of photographs that have touched you the most, that have had the biggest impact on you? You know, I would say the photographs that have impacted me the most are the ones you don't see. Because in every story I do, I have to make an edit. You know, I was just showing some stories from, from Lebanon of Syrian families. There were other families that I photographed that didn't make the cut, so to speak. And those are the ones that haunt me because I feel I've failed those people. Because the reality is often these images mean lives do change. But what about the photographs we don't see? And those stories that don't get told, those people have trusted me with their story. And for various reasons, you can't tell every story. So yeah, the ones that really affect me are the photographs that are still here in, in my head. And I always feel I failed those people. Um, and what advice would you have to a photographer who wants to go to a conflict zone? And maybe they want the glory, maybe they want to focus on the people who are disenfranchised. What advice would you give to them? The first thing is make sure you're trained. You know, make sure you're trained in, in first aid. It's something that I've, I've encountered where people have been injured and really could have been saved if there had been people around them that had first aid training. So first thing is, is get trained. Secondly, ask yourself, why am I doing this? Am I doing this for myself? You know, you, I think when you photograph somebody who is injured, somebody suffering in, in conflict, it comes with huge responsibility. And I always ask myself, why am I taking this photograph? Am I doing it for myself or am I doing it for them? And I think it's really important to remember, you know, I, I was photographed myself moments after being injured. I know what it's like to have somebody point a camera at you in your worst moment, and it's hurtful and difficult. And so just remember, if you go to a conflict zone, you go to that, don't do it for your own glory. You know, do it because you think it can make a difference, but please don't do it just because you want the action, you want the excitement. People are suffering, people are dying. You know, I, I, the, the pictures that you showed when you were first injured, um, one of the first thoughts, because of course you're a photographer as well, is do you have a relationship with the person who shot the photographs? Uh, and does that relationship continue to this day? You know, I, I didn't, I didn't, I wasn't aware of the photographer that was on the Medivac helicopter. It was only afterwards. And in fact, the pictures appeared in the New York Times, which is how many people found out about my injuries. Um, you know, they asked my brother whether they should be published. And my brother said he would want that um, because I felt it was, imp and I, I do think it was, it was fine that they were published, but I, I feel slightly uh, detached from them. Um, it's like looking at somebody, somebody else. And I think when I first saw them, I thought everyone thought I was going to be quite traumatized by seeing them. And I just looked at them and thought, well, I would have framed them differently and I'd have probably done it in black and white. <laughs> uh, another question. Uh, have you found that the world's view on people with disabilities has improved in any way over the past 10 years or not so much? You know, it's it's improving. And, and I'm very grateful to be living in a country that is is forward thinking, but there's still a long way to go. And you know, you, you look at the representation, for example, of, of people living with disability on television, a very, very small percentage of people. And we tend to be always portrayed as the villain, villains. Uh, and, you know, it was only recently, in fact, I was making a comment about James Bond films. Um, and maybe it's time for a one armed James Bond, because it's actually, though, quite hurtful, though. You will notice every James Bond villain always has a facial disfigurement, is missing a limb, is living with a disability. We have to stop representing people on television with disability as always the villains. So true. Uh, here's another question. So you talked about, um, you know, the physical uh, challenges that you face, the 37 operations. Um, can you walk us through some of the mental health issues that you went through and how long that recovery took? And are you there? You know, I, I suffered for many years uh, from very, very bad depression. It's something that I have spoken about um, and that was in my, my late 20s and my 30s, um, early 30s. And I managed to get through that when I finally found purpose, which is when I became a photographer that I am now. I always say that that battle with, with mental health was far harder than losing three limbs. It was the greater battle. And what gave me the strength to get through my injuries was the strength, the resilience that I had built dealing with depression. So when people... Uh, sort of trivialize what mental health is when people say to people, oh, just pull yourself together. I can speak from experience. I have suffered from very bad uh, depression and I've suffered from pretty traumatic injuries. And I can tell you from my personal experience, the battle for my mental health was harder. But what got me through it, it was finding purpose. Yeah, I think that's true with so many people in life. It doesn't matter if you're disabled or not. Um, so uh, where to next? Is there another conflict zone you're off to anytime soon? Is there a plan in place? Yeah, the, 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 there's always a plan. Unfortunately, there's no shortage of stories for me to tell. And 
But what I'm interested in increasingly is actually telling stories about food and showing how people come together. You know, I don't think we need to be reminded how difficult the world is right now. And actually what I want to remind people of is resilience and strength. And there are people all around the world that have gone through incredibly difficult things that I know that see more joy in life than anyone. I think resilience is not something you can make yourself. Resilience is life's gift for suffering. And the whole world at the moment is going through a difficult time, which thinks, I think means we'll all come out this slightly more resilient. So actually, although I'll be going to places like uh, DL Congo soon and, and South Sudan, I'm trying to focus on more positive stories and stories of resilience and hope. Wonderful. Um, any final comments that you'd care to make to this audience that we have no, with us? I would, again, just, just stress that point. It's a very difficult time for many, many people in, in the world. And I know many people are suffering from, from mental health issues. They're finding lockdown incredibly difficult. What I would say again is it's okay to have bad days. It's okay to have days when you feel upset and overwhelmed. But remember, resilience is the reward that we will all get at the end of this. And we will all find next year we're able to deal with things that a year ago seemed overwhelming. So just keep the faith. Very well said. Well, this concludes the WISH Masterclass, Masterclass edition of the EC Speaker Series. Today's event is exactly what we try to do on a daily basis at Education City. Share ideas, discuss experiences, and tell great stories. Thank you to Giles for sharing and passing on his insight and experiences. And many thanks to our audience spread around the world for tuning in and being part of this event. If this has left you wanting to find out more about the Education City Speaker Series and Cut to Foundation, please visit qf.org.qa. The full discussion will shortly be uploaded on Cut to Foundation's YouTube page. On behalf of the entire WISH and QF teams, goodbye, stay safe, and be well. Thank you, Giles. I appreciate it. Thank you.